This is Stanford Engineering's Future of Everything, and I'm your host, Russ Altman. AI technologies for making predictions have already permeated many aspects of our lives. When we ask our medical insurance company to cover a procedure, we expect them to be fair in making that decision. When we apply for a loan or a credit card, we expect the bank to treat us fairly. When we look for a job, we expect to compete fairly for the position. But who defines what is fair? Is there a single definition or is it dependent on the context? Can it be defined mathematically? Well, Omar Rheingold is a professor of computer science at Stanford University. He is an expert at cryptography, privacy, and theoretical computer science. But he has recently developed an interest and research program in how we should define and implement fairness in computer algorithms. So you have this great interest in fairness, but how do we connect the dots between an interest in cryptography and an interest in fairness and bias? In fact, along the way from cryptography to, to fairness, I, I've had a few more stops, uh, but I think all of these are connected by the com computational lens. So the understanding that you need to take into account the computational abilities of all the parties that are involved. So in cryptography, when you encrypt a message and you send it, uh, it usually contains all the information that you want to hide. So if the, the person is dropping would be as powerful as, as they want, uh, then um, um, they, they could recover what you sent. Um, but we are relying on the fact that they are not as powerful as, as they, they want. They are bounded by the natural limitation on, on the ability to compute. Similarly, in fairness, uh, what we're trying to do in our line of research is to look at, the, at how computational resources affect notions of fairness. So fairness, of course, was something that existed uh, or discussed forever in other disciplines. But now that we are discussing it in the context of computation, we need to understand computational limits. Great. So let's start out by understanding what is the challenge here. I think that in the popular press, one of the main areas where fairness is coming up is in AI systems that are making decisions that people really care about. Uh, in my field of medicine, this happens. It also happens in uh, banking and finance. Do you get the loan? Do you get the credit? Um, in medicine, it's do you get admitted to the hospital? What studies should we do? Um, so could you tell me what are the primary challenges that make fairness a hot topic these days from your perspective? Right. So fairness definitely got a huge boost uh, uh, given the machine learning revolution. And it's affecting all the areas that you discussed, but in fact, every area. So it affects the people that we date and eventually perhaps marry, the kind of uh, news that we read, what is our perspective on the world. And uh, so e everything is kind of uh, masked by the decisions of algorithms. And so we want to say, I mean, if algorithms are making decisions or at least informing decisions, we want them not to discriminate. Uh, the challenge in this area uh, is that it is, um, I mean, fairness is not one thing. In fact, right. most of the things that we study, and most of the people that study things in, in Stanford or anywhere else, don't study one thing that is very, very easy to define. But fairness is indeed one of those things. So fairness depends on, on the context, on the culture. Uh, so we can't have a single mathematical definition a definition that would capture fairness. On the other hand, the perspective that I come from is that if you don't have definitions, you don't have anything. So you ask about cryptography. If you encrypt something and you send it uh, over the wire and you don't know that you, uh, what kind of security you have, you're in a very weak situation. In fairness, it's even worse because once something is done, we can argue, is it fair or isn't it fair? So we need real definitions that tell us this is fair under this notion, but not fair under that notion. And uh, so it's very, very early and very hard to uh, capture. Yeah, that, so that's great. I'm glad you mentioned that because, you know, 
the, the one of the earliest memories that everybody has is playing games as a child where something happens to you and at least in english you would yell out no fair <laughs> and that is a very fun and and of course then there would be a long discussion on the playground exactly as you just described it, does, it only takes a four-year-old to say i was expecting a certain scent of operational characteristics and what you just did violates my uh, expectation about what how it should go and so i am shouting out no fair so i i love the idea i'm intrigued i'm intrigued by the idea that we can have mathematical definitions and you've already said it won't be a single definition and i think that's a very important point because i think people would immediately respond that makes no sense to have one single definition so can you tell me in a little bit more detail how math can capture fairness and maybe by giving an example in one area that's been the best studied or, or one particular version of fairness yeah, uh, glad to. Just your story reminds me what happens when a teenager shouts it's not fair and then the parent says, you know, life is not fair. And, you know, that's, that's a reaction we get from time to time when we try to say, oh, you know, you need to enforce some kind of fairness. They say, life is not fair. Uh, right. But we can't accept that, I think. Um, so uh, the way I view definitions uh, here is like a language. So there is, when we discuss fairness, there is the language that philosophy gives us, let's say political philosophy, there is the language that uh, legal experts give us. And given that computations are doing it, we need a language for computations. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we are developing it. So the classic definitions of fairness are very, very weak, but they're very easy to explain. So I'll start there. Great, so great. One of my life uh, goals as a researcher or research goals is to get rid of those definitions. But those definitions say, you know what, let's look at, um, at the entire population. Uh, let's start with something easy, like ads, right? I want to show, uh, uh, I'm using a very benign, but it's not always that benign application of advertising. I'm going to show... We, we've ad. seen that in the last couple of years. Absolutely. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to show an ad for... Um, for uh, high-tech jobs and I want to show them at the same uh, f probability for to men and women otherwise in some sense I'm excluding one of the groups from from this market uh, so this is called statistical parity I'm showing it in the right uh, in the same fraction other notions are trying to take uh, some kind of merit into account so when applying to loans, given that it's private companies, and then sometimes we'll say, at least if two individuals have the same capability of repaying the loan, they are as likely to repay the loan, I want the probability that I'm giving the loan to each other to be the same. But so right, so that's very interesting, because unlike the ad where it's a simple men, women, let's make them balanced, you're adding a estimation of capability to uh, pay uh, to, to the uh, definition of fairness. Exactly. And that's a lot of what we're trying um, to do. Actually, it's a lot of what machine learning is trying to do. Machine learning is creating models of how uh, events are going, what's the probability of various events. Um, in particular, they will create a model of what's the probability that uh, somebody will repay a loan or succeed in the university or click on an ad. And all of these are have a heart attack in the next 10 years and all of these probabilities are part of what of the decisions that are taken after that so we try so, so let, let me ask you because the, uh, uh, this gets right to one of the core issues that i know you've thought about a lot which is that when you're making these predictions, it's often currently uh, the AI, the machine learning systems are often based on existing historical data. And then what everybody has recognized, not everybody, but what many people have recognized is that historical data may have embedded bias and unfairness because of social structures and uh, where if you use that in an unvarnished way to make your decisions, you're already baking in the unfairness. And I'm sure you think about this. And so in the case that you just said where we're looking at credit and maybe certain groups have been excluded from credit and so they have a deflated estimate of ability to pay or inflated or whatever. So how do you think about those issues? I just wanted to grab it because this was a great example for where the data could really not serve you well. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to talk about the data. I just want to say perhaps 
for us to discuss later that we all we kind of tend to place a lot of the, the blame on the data and partly this is correct but there are a lot of issues that come that arise after the data and a lot of things ah. to do in the process of learning so uh, we can uh, come back to it so data can i'm writing that down and i'm circling it so <laughs> i promise to come back to that perfect very happy so data can be faulty in in several ways so i can try to classify that one is kind of under representation uh, perhaps some groups didn't get loans in the past we don't have enough files of people of that population and and it's hard for us to to make decisions and the other issue is uh, missing um, missing labels that are uh, important for one group and not important for the other. So if I'll take a, an example from a different place, when you admit to college, often AP classes are a major uh, factor in the decision. But some schools don't offer AP classes. And for these schools, we somehow need another feature that would do the same thing that AP classes do uh -huh. In the stronger in the stronger group, so missing important attributes is is important, and um, and the third one is mislabeling. So, for example, taking an example from a third area of of uh, incarceration, if you want to predict the probability that something somebody would make an offense, you'll take historic data, but usually your historic data will not capture, will not label the all the offenses. They will uh, only label the, the times when, when you were caught. So what the labels are saying is the probability that you'll be caught, and, and that depends on the level of policing. So if if you live in a community that, that sees higher levels of policing, then it will look like you have a higher probability of, 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 of offense. So yes. all of these are, are different problems, and, and we are trying to address all of them. Um, I want to say that uh, we have ways of addressing some of them, but one thing that we should appreciate, and I don't think that is appreciated enough in machine learning, is that one of the things we should do at, po at some point is say, we don't have good enough data. We just cannot use this data. Come back to us when the data is better. And, and some yes. of what we're trying to do is to identify these cases. To identify cases, to separate the case where the data is too bad for us to do anything useful from the case that the data is good enough, but we were lazy in the way that we learned from the data. That, that's a very, very interesting point, because in, in the, in, as an academic, you and I can imagine saying no to that. If you're a company that's trying to sell machine learning services and every client is income, it's a, a huge act of self-restraint right. to say, we don't think we can help you. But maybe maybe, the, maybe those companies will, will, will start to, to do that. Um, well, let's go to the after data. Uh, I promised we would go there. So you actually gave a beautiful set of examples about how the data itself could be very misleading. Um, tell me about life after the data. Life after data. So, um, so there is a reason that we, I mean, humans are also right discriminating and and have stereotypes. Computers, in the way they learn, are uh, use stereotypes for similar reasons, in a sense. Uh, when you're investing your effort in learning, right? When you learn, you try to discriminate, and and we think about discrimination as a negative thing. But in learning, this is the positive thing. This is what you want to, to do to discriminate those that have higher probability, and lower probability of some something. And right. if there is a small community, perhaps with few people that have, let's say, in the loans case, let's say in some community there is a lower level of ability to repay loans then perhaps the learning algorithm will get more <clears throat> uh, by investing more effort in the general population than in the minority population that has small probability. And, and therefore, the learning algorithm will eventually create a model that, as a stereotype, it looks at individuals from this population and says, you know, they cannot repay a loan. They, it looks at it as monolithic. Yes. Um, so when we're thinking about learning, we say, oh, this is an objective process, but learning tries to optimize something, and we need to tell it what's, what to optimize. For example, in our work, what we try to say is, you can't only optimize on the general population. It's important to optimize on many subpopulations, uh, because otherwise, 
just the learning algorithm by itself will invest the effort where it's more uh, worthy uh, in terms of just right. general general loss minimization. So this is where you, as the person doing the machine learning, cannot have a simple goal of global optimality, global profit, so to speak. But you can say, in addition to my profit, I have duties to serve other uh, societal priorities. Uh, and then you can actually build that in mathematically to the function that's deciding whether a certain machine learning algorithm is performing well or not. Exactly, exactly. Perfect. So, so you talked about groups, and I know you've published and talked a lot about the difference between fairness towards a group and fairness towards an individual. And so I just wanted to end this segment of our discussion with understanding that tension. Yeah, so uh, our first work on this was 12 years ago, and it started in a sense this line of research of kind of uh, fairness in this context. And it was exactly about this gap between groups and individuals. What we said is that fairness towards group is very, very weak. You can abuse each one of those. I have stories uh, for each one of those notions. It's easy to abuse it. Uh, uh, although, uh, um, so for, I, if you have time, I, I'll give you one yes, example. Yes, yes. Uh, so uh, let's think about the ads. And let's say I'm advertising a, a burger joint. And there is a population S that I really want to exclude. I don't like people from S. So what I can do is advertise to people from, to carnivores in the general populations, but to vegans in S. So I'm advertising to a lot of people in S. I'm satisfying this general uh, global kind of uh, requirement, but I'm excluding them because I'm advertising to the wrong people. Uh -huh. uh, so we have observed that all of these notions uh, that are very prevalent in, in the study, this is the main uh, notions that are studied, are very weak. And instead we try to give notions that give some guarantees to individuals. And that work specifically was about how to treat similar people similarly, which is a notion from law, but we gave a mathematical definition that makes it possible for algorithms to, to enforce it on algorithms. You can go to algorithms, say, sim treat similar people similarly and, and end with that. You need to somehow define it and, and make it operate operative. I mean, the uh, push towards the individual is going to be a very attractive idea for even non-experts because people want individual fairness at the end of the day. And although they care about their group, uh, you could also make the case, and I, we'll talk about this in the next segment perhaps, whether if you can show that every individual of a group is being treated fairly, then you're allowed to conclude that the group is also being treated fairly. I don't know if that's true, but we'll find out. This is The Future of Everything with Russ Altman. More with Omer Rheingold next on Sirius XM Business Radio Channel. 132. Welcome back to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Professor Omer Rheingold of Stanford University. In the last segment, Omer discussed the complexity of defining fairness and trying to ensure that computer programs act fairly when they make predictions. In this segment, he will tell us how predictions for individuals should be interpreted in something he calls multi-group fairness. He also reports that computer scientists, legal experts, and economists are already meeting regularly to figure out the best way to ensure that each of these disciplines can work together to find good definitions of fairness for both regulation and for economic competitiveness. Thank you. So, um, so that's, that's a great question because when you look at, uh, at this probability, I mean, this specific individual is one individual will either have a heart attack in the next 10 years or not have a heart attack. It's not an event that's going to be sampled again and again, and four out of 100 times this person is going to have a heart attack. So it's not completely clear what these uh, probabilities mean, and this, this is the main thing on which we base so many decisions, which is yes. why it's connected to fairness. Of course, statisticians have been arguing about what it means for, for a lot of time, and there are various perspectives, but what we try to say in, in, in our work is that you also need a computational perspective. I'll give you an example, uh, an even simpler example, something we all think we know what it is, so a flip of a coin. So when I flip a coin, and if, if the coin is in the air, I ask you heads or tail, whatever you say, you have probably half to be correct. So it looks like the, this is an unbiased coin, and it will 
uh, will fall with probability half on heads, probability half on tails. Um, but if uh, you had lots of monitors kind of measuring the exact location of the coin, and it, they were connected to com very powerful computers, they could tell you with probability one uh, if it's going to be heads or tails. Because it's just physics, and if you have enough computation, you can do physics. Exactly. So, so this coin, does it have probability half or does it have probability one to be heads? And so when you go to the doctor and they say 4%, what they actually say is that there is some group of individuals that you, are, you have the same attributes like them, and 4% of the, the, these individuals are going to have a heart attack. Yes. But the real problem here in, from the point of view of fairness is what group I, am I viewing you? part of because in one group you'll have four percent in a different group you'll have six percent in a third one you'll have two percent and this will affect if, if you're getting a particular medicine or not so this directly relate to how do i view you and in, yes. in medicine there is a lot of issue of how do we take race or should we take or shouldn't we take race into account when making these decisions what we've tried to do is this notion of multi-group fairness we want predictions that will be accurate uh, for a huge amount of groups. So if I view you in one group, my prediction will be correct on average. In a different group, it will be correct on average. So we're creating something that is correct uh, for uh, every group that, in a sense, we can identify with our computational powers. So this sounds r really great. Tell, let me let me just repeat back if I, make sure I heard it correctly. So you may or may not have put me in the right group when you told me four uh, percent, but and you can imagine other groups. And, and are you saying that you're going to kind of sample my uh, probabilities in a bunch of different groups in order to get a more robust understanding of my actual risk? Uh, is that the idea? The idea is that I'm going to look at, at lots of groups. Exponential yes. number of groups, which which sounds bizarre, and then make sure that that on average I'm correct on all of them. So I'm taking these very okay. weak notions of group fairness, and they are weak because I'm looking at one group or ten groups, and I'm making them very very strong because now I, I'm I'm looking at an exponential number of groups. So yes. now for you individually, I can't assure you that your prediction is exact, but what I can assure you that if you want to be treated as part of group A then on group A I'm correct on average. And if you want to, if you prefer to be looked at as part of group B, then on group B uh, I'm correct on average. Yes, okay. That's great because as a physician, those percentages are most often used for me to determine my level of aggressiveness in treating the patient. So if it's 30%, I'm going to do everything tomorrow to reduce their heart risk a tr you know, diet, medication, exercise. If it's 0.01%, I'm going to tell them, I'll see you next year and we'll do this all over again. You don't have to do anything different right now. So that, that will be very valuable to a physician because then my level of response is calibrated and I know that I'm re responding uh, consistent with both the data and perhaps me and the patient's wishes about how to classify this patient, which group they are best represented by. Yes, yes, and, and in fact, we have been using our techniques and definitions in medical in medical cases, and shown how to very easily take predictors that are used in medicine and make them much better in this sense that they are calibrated on many groups rather than on a few groups. Great. So, so in the last couple of minutes, I wanted to open it up to the kind of societal implications of these technologies. You, you and your colleagues are working very hard. It's starting to work. You're, you're publishing papers. The, the two things I think about are, is the legal system uh, ready for this? In other words, when these are deployed by companies, um, are they is the rubric under which their responsibility falls clear? Are we prepared for a world of fair or even unfair AI? And so I know this is not your specific technical interest, but I'm sure you think about it as a, as a general uh, citizen. So where are we with the legal economic um, pressures and tensions? And so in fact, a lot of the work in this area is, is multidisciplinary. So I, I find myself in a lot of workshop, a lot of events with a lot of people either from the legal or from the economic uh, realm. Um, I, I sometimes think about my work as, as kind of imagining that somebody would ask me, okay, I want to put on regulations 
what should they be? So kind of preparing the re possible regulations, and it's not easy. The legal, uh, the, the legal world works very slowly. Regulations and laws are, are usually behind what we understand. Yeah. And sometimes there's a conflict. So many times you're not allowed. Our, our first work was called the Fairness Through Awareness, and we gave reason to think that you need to know uh, sensitive attributes for fairness. And uh, that's not always allowed legally, right? right? So kind of trying to make our work relevant to the real world is something that we care about and we, we try to do. And I think that kind of some level of regulations and, and uh, laws are important here. So, yeah, the economic, uh, we are outnumbered in all, in all aspects. Uh, when we work on fairness and all of these communities together are still outnumbered uh, compared to the huge economic benefits and, and not only economic you talked about medical there's a lot of benefits to society so there's a lot of benefits and a lot of economic uh, uh, incentives and, and we are kind of uh, <laughs> uh, trying to do our best to fight back I actually find the fact that you're at meetings with those folks is probably the biggest good news of, of, of all, because it's only by their awareness of your technical approaches, your awareness of the pressures and constraints on them that will lead to resolution. So I think we can take a lot of heart to know that the computer scientists in AI are meeting with the lawyers, are meeting with the economists and figuring out a way forward. And that's really all we can expect. Thanks to Omer Rheingold. That was the future of fairness. You have been listening to The Future of Everything with Russ Altman on Sirius XM Business Radio Channel 132.